start the debate on this bill and finish our remarks. And I know we will have many amendments. I just hope in the end we have a good bill that does satisfy everyone's needs and that we can permanently say winter is over. Thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. President. First, uh, I want to uh, congratulate Senator Rockefeller and Senator Hutchinson for uh, their leadership in putting together what is such an important bill, over 280 thousand jobs that are saved or created as a result of this, uh, focusing on our ability to out-innovate and out-build in the global economy. We can't do that without a 21st century uh, uh, FAA system, uh, airports, air traffic control, and so on. And so uh, I joined with Senator Hutchinson in hoping that, uh, and I'm, I'm sure it will be true that at the end of the day, we will have a, a strong bipartisan vote because they're really moving forward in the spirit in which we've all come together saying we, we want to move forward, and that is uh, working hard, focusing on jobs. That's what the American people want us to do is focus on jobs, finding common ground, uh, working across the aisle. That's what is evident from this bill, and so uh, I'm uh, very appreciative of the fact that they're focusing, and I want to thank our leader for making sure that the very first bill that we are bringing up is about jobs. We understand that too many families, certainly in my state, Mr. President, are still looking for work. They've worked hard all their lives and never thought in a million years they'd find themselves in the situation that they're in. And so they want us to be laser focused on jobs in the economy and out competing in a global economy, as the president said. And this bill is exactly the kind of uh, policy that we should be focused on. Uh, what is concerning to me is that while we are doing that, uh, we are now going to have a, de a debate uh, that is very divisive, at really looking backwards rather than looking forwards. Um, one of the things that the President talked about, again, which I agree with strongly, is that in the area of health care, uh, we know there are things that we can fix to make what we passed last year, to make our system more competitive, to make it better for families, to put families back in control rather than insurance companies. We know there are things that we can do to make it better. And certainly no one has been more of a champion than uh, our leader on this legislation, not only the chairman of the Commerce Committee, but uh, uh, one of uh, the leaders, the number two on the Finance Committee, who brought his passion to the issue uh, of health care as well. And so we know that things can be fixed, and we want to work together on the things to make it better, but not fight old fights, create political fights and division, and certainly not roll back the clock where we put all the control in insurance companies and we see our families losing the freedom and security to make sure that their children, that their family has the health care they need. So let me first talk about my amendment and then why I uh, believe that we should be focused on this kind of amendment to fix the, the bill that passed last year, the new law to make it better rather than rolling the clock back. And certainly we've heard now, uh, uh, if you follow the polls, that four out of five Americans are saying, don't go back and just uh, repeal what was done, but fix it. So the majority of people are not supporting uh, going back to old political fights or going back, frankly, to a system that's an uncontrolled system where insurance companies can raise rates to 20, 30, 40 percent uh, every year without some plan, some focus to be able to lower costs, to be able to get people out of emergency rooms and into the doctor's offices, and frankly, for people who have insurance not to be placed into a situation where they continually see their rates go up to pay for people that don't, and so, which is what we have put in place. But there is a provision that has been uh, a concern of mine and many others. We've debated it now on the floor. Uh, we've attempted to get it fixed we, uh, several different times, and I hope today, I hope tomorrow, whenever we vote on this, that we will actually be able to get this fixed. This is something that has been supported on uh, both sides of the aisle, and it deals with eliminating red tape and burdensome IRS reporting requirements for our businesses, particularly small businesses. Um, we, we are particularly concerned about what this means for small businesses, the provision that was placed into the bill that now as we look at how the IRS would implement it is clearly too burdensome 
and uh, my amendment would repeal that, Mr. President. It would allow business owners to spend their time growing their company and creating jobs instead of filling out paperwork from the IRS. We want them creating jobs. It's a common sense solution uh, to an issue that has come up and it basically would uh, uh, make sure that the provision that would require a 1099 form for every vendor uh, when a company uh, has a purchase of $600 or more for goods uh, would, not be, uh, would no longer be in place. This is a provision that actually doesn't take effect until uh, next year, but we want to send a very clear message to businesses who have expressed great concern about this, about what is coming for them at the end of the year. We want to let them know that uh, we would not continue the new provision. Uh, we would allow small businesses who already create 64 percent of the jobs to be able to keep creating those jobs, and uh, we would make sure that we are not putting in place uh, additional uh, paperwork for them. One of the things that I think is important to note is that according to the IRS, the provision that we want to repeal, if left unchecked, would impact about 40 million American businesses, 40 million and 26 million of them are sole proprietorships, our smallest businesses, and they would be overwhelmed with the paperwork that's involved and it doesn't make any sense. We've passed a great small business jobs bill last fall that created eight different tax cuts and focused on making capital loans more available for small businesses. We don't want to now go the other direction and see a mountain of paperwork added to the small businesses that we have been very committed to fighting for and to be supporting. So uh, unfortunately, if this provision were allowed to stand, it would require a 2,000 percent increase in 1099 filings. And frankly, Mr. President, that just doesn't make sense. So this particular provision uh, would repeal what was placed into uh, the new health care law. We pay for the repeal uh, by cutting $44 billion in unobligated spending. We do uh, make it clear, I mean, certainly this does not affect Medicare or Social Security benefits in any way. I wouldn't support that. Uh, and, uh, and I know that my uh, colleagues on the floor would not as well. We would make it clear that Department of Defense, Veterans Affairs, and Social Security Administration are not included, but it would give the uh, Management and Budget Office the ability to look at uh, the possibilities and areas for cut, and they would then report back to us in 60 days after enactment to Secretary of Treasury and the Congress concerning the amounts and uh, the accounts that they would be uh, using in order to cut back, in order to save this particular provision. So this is an area where we can come together, where Democrats and Republicans on both of the, uh, sides of the aisle uh, who care passionately about small business can come together, eliminate uh, red tape and burdensome IRS reporting provisions, get that off the table, make it clear now to small businesses that there is no intent or, or actuality that this is going to happen, and we can do that together. But Mr. President, what we shouldn't be doing is what the next amendment, the Republican Leader's Amendment, uh, would do. Because his amendment would take us back to the time of uncontrolled insurance company increases, no accountability, and it would put the control of health care coverage and costs back in the hands of insurance companies. What I support and what the new law allows is the freedom and security for families to make sure they can get the medical care that they need when they need it. You know, I have two beautiful grandchildren, three, a granddaughter age three and a grandson age one, and they are the most beautiful children in the world, just for the record. I want my son and daughter-in-law picking up the phone and being able to call the doctor when they get sick, not fighting with the insurance company. Now, if this is repealed, they go back to fighting with the insurance company. I want them making sure that my grandchildren 
as well as my children, as well as my mom, as well as everyone else in my family, and, the, and certainly everyone in Michigan and in the country, to be getting the medical care they need, not fighting with the insurance company, not worrying that because their child has juvenile diabetes or leukemia or some other uh, disease or condition, that the insurance company is going to say, tough luck. I don't, I'm not going to cover your child, even though your child needs care. Or you suddenly get sick and they say, well, you know, there's some fine print over here and uh, we know you're sick, but we're going to cancel your coverage. Or, well, we've got 10 treatments that we'll provide, even though, you know, the doctor says you need 20. The, right now, because of what we've done, in the Patients' Bill of Rights that was put into place, we put those decisions in the hands of families and doctors instead of insurance companies. And I certainly am not going to vote to take it back to putting it in the hands of the insurance companies. Frankly, I uh, have been uh, having many, many families approach me to say thank you for the fact that now they uh, have the ability, the freedom, the security to put their uh, child that's 22, 23, 25 on their insurance. They get that first job, doesn't have health insurance, but they can go out, get started, and know that they've got the peace of mind that they have health insurance. That would be taken away under what the Republican leader is proposing. We would see young people going back to no insurance as a result of that. Right now we have seniors that know that they're going to have their freedom and security to be able to get the cancer screening that they need, the wellness visit, um, even if they don't have the out-of-pocket, the copay and deductible uh, that, that, was, uh, that they were being charged in the past because there is no copay and deductible now. They will be able to get what they need in preventative care. They will be able to have the peace of mind, the security, to know that if they use a lot of medicine and they fall in a gap in coverage, that the cost in that gap is going to be cut in half. Cut in half. Any brand name drugs this year, cut in half. Now what does that do? Well, that means that my mom, who's 84, has the security to know that her great-grandchildren are going to have her around longer, a lot longer, I hope. Because she's going to be able to play with those kids. Uh, every older person is going to know they've got a better chance to be around for their grandkids because they're going to be able to afford the medicine that will help them stay healthy. That is taken away in the Republican leader's amendment. The freedom and security for seniors to know that they can stay healthy, that they can stay in their home, that they can have the medicine they need or the doctor's visits they need to be able to stay healthy and live a long, healthy, healthier life. That is taken away. The freedom and security for women to know that we aren't going to pay twice as much as men for insurance, which, by the way, in the majority of policies, prior to passing this, if, you, if women go out to buy an insurance policy, over half the policies, women pay as much as twice as much. And we change that. We've also said that things like maternity care ought to be a basic part of a health insurance policy. And maybe we won't be 39th in the world in the number of babies that live through the first year of their life if moms are able to get the prenatal care they need and babies are able to get it through the first year of their life. So this gives women the freedom of knowing they, and the security of knowing they're going to have what they need to be able to have healthy babies. Isn't that what we all want? That is taken away with Republican leaders' amendment. And among many, many other things, I will just mention two others. For the first time, we are putting accountability on the insurance industry. And again, our chairman of the Commerce Committee led this effort and the Finance Committee to say, you know what, when you pay a hard-earned dollar out of your pocket for health insurance, 
And, and, and it's tough because these rates have been high, and unfortunately, until we get this fully implemented, they keep going up. They're trying to keep it going up until they have to stop. That the majority of that's got to go for medical care. So depending on the size of your policy, either, either 80 or 85 percent of what you pay in has to go out in medical care. Not profits to the companies, not executive compensation, not bureaucracy, but medical care. And what does that mean? It means that it will limit the rate increases over time and put more accountability on the companies. The Republican Leader's Amendment rolls that back. We have companies now that spend 60% of every dollar you give on medical care, 70%. This would say 80 or 85 percent. The majority of your hard-earned dollars, they're hard to come by in this economy. If it's for health care, then it should be used on health care. And that is what is repealed in this, accountability on insurance companies. And I will finally say this. What is also repealed is a major focus in this bill is on supporting small businesses to be able to get a better deal on health insurance. And this takes away the freedom and security for a small business to be able to get the leverage that they need, like a big business, to get a better deal on rates. So, and I wish this is something that took effect. If we want to change something, I wish we would speed that up. <laughs> that needs to be faster, in my judgment, and not having to wait now for the next three years. Because we've got all kinds of small businesses who are going to be able to band together and be able to get a better rate like a big business through competition in the marketplace, not government control, private sector competition. I had an opportunity to talk to a gentleman who uh, runs a program for our automakers and other manufacturers for retirees. It's a health exchange exactly like we passed in this new law. And he said to me, I don't think, Senator, you guys even realize how good it is at what you have done in terms of creating a marketplace and competition to bring rates down. He said, we bring rates down about 30% for the auto companies, for retiree coverage, about 30% because of competition in this bill, leverage for small businesses and tax cuts to help small businesses pay for it. In the new law, taken away by the Republican leader's amendment. So Mr. President, I would hope in the spirit of the underlying bill, which is a great jobs bill. It's a great bill for innovation. It's, it, it's about rebuilding our infrastructure. It's about competing in a global economy. It's about being the best we can be. I would hope that in the spirit of the bill, FAA, we would not succumb to this backwards divisiveness, political debates on repeal, and if we want to join together on something on health care, I would strongly urge a 100% a vote on eliminating this burdensome provision for small businesses, eliminate the red tape, eliminate this IRS provision on 1099. Let's do something together that, that both sides agree should be done. Let's fix the things that needs to be fixed, but let's not roll back the clock and put insurance companies in charge of everything, every medical decision, every rate increase like it was in the past. So I urge the adoption of uh, the Stabenow Amendment. We will have a number of colleagues that are uh, in the process of joining. I don't have the whole list. We will have a number of colleagues who will be co-sponsors. I also want to thank Senator Bacchus for his leadership on this, uh, his ongoing leadership, but his leadership on this amendment as well. And I would urge adoption of this amendment to fix what we know uh, needs to be fixed and then let us get on to jobs. Thank you. Mr. President. Senator from West Virginia. Um, I don't see any other folks around who want to talk on the FAA bill for the moment or on much else for the moment. So um, I'm going to suggest the absence of a quorum, but not yet. The, and I'm hoping that Senator Baucus and Senator Hatch will come down to sort of oversee the 1099 argument, then a whole number of us will speak on the 
repeal the health bill, uh, which is just about the worst idea I've ever heard. And I think it'll be voted down, and I think the minority knows that. And I think they're just, I don't know, I don't know who they're trying to speak to. When I think of the health care bill and all the work that went into it, the work that went into it is not important. It's the product that came out. When he says that the American people are against it, that was actually quite true for a year and a half, maybe almost two years, because we were in the process of making the bill. It was kind of like making sausage, so people just turned against it. And, um, but now it's going in quite the opposite direction. Now as people begin to get some of the benefits, and they understand some of the conditions that they're going to be unbonded from, uh, they won't be slaves anymore to costs determined by others who don't really care about their health care. I think that the momentum is swinging, and I think what, what we, we would be being condemned to if the motion were to pass and health care were to be repealed in that there aren't really any particular ideas of note which were put forward by the other party about what we should do to make it better uh, other than to repeal it. We would be here another two or three years trying to write a bill uh, and not having a bill. And we would be in the situation as follows. I just uh, recall in the year 2008, just happened to recall this because we worked on this in the Commerce Committee. The, um, the five largest insurance companies in America, health insurance companies in America, uh, made profits of $12.4 billion. I don't have a problem with that. What I do have a problem with is what was, they were doing and what will continue to happen if we repeal the health care bill. And that is while they were making all that money, they were through the process of rescission. That means unilateral decision that because somebody has acne or has been through a C-section or, you know, asthma or any number of things, they actually insured three million fewer people while they were making that $12.4 billion by the sole act, which is their right under the previous law, which we corrected, to do rescissions. That is, by their own decision to simply remove health care from people who made an agreement with them, signed up, but then sending in premiums and all the rest of it. I also think about um, a young eight-year-old that I met in, in Charleston at a, a meeting, a town meeting, and he had had leukemia for a while. Uh, now, in this health care bill, lifetime limits and annual limits on what you can get in the way of health insurance, and you have leukemia, the lid is lifted off. Uh, the boy died, and he died because he couldn't get insurance. And his family obviously couldn't afford to pay for it, and he couldn't get it, and so he died. Now, people say, well, that's kind of an extra dramatic example, but unfortunately it is not. It's very common. Something else that would disappear if the health care bill were repealed is something which nobody ever talks about, which, which is sort of the philosophical basis for a lot of this. And it's called the fee-for-service system, which we now have in America on uh, medical care, and particularly with Medicare, but generally. And that is the, ser the person who provides the service or the medical equipment person who provides the medical equipment or the hospital which provides the service. They provide the service and they just bill Medicare. Medicare doesn't ask any questions. Medicare just pays the bill. Now, that's one of the reasons, of the many reasons, why if the, repeal, the bill is repealed, we will go into hock a trillion, three hundred billion more dollars on our deficit because, um, because our bill saves that kind of money. Uh, their bill would vitiate that kind of saving. Fee-for-service is not the way healthcare ought to work. The way it ought to work is that, like anything else, we are at this, in this very bill. There's no tree on this bill. What happened in the Senate? There was an epiphany of some sort. We decided to be transparent.
to be accountable. So anybody can offer uh, amendments on anything, and, and indeed they are, and will. But um, accountability is called efficiency and makes better results. And under the bill that has been passed, um, people are held accountable for what they do. And hospitals, for example, or doctors, or medical equipment people, they are measured by what their outcomes are. In other words, it's evidence-based outcomes. What are the results of what you have been doing in healthcare? Are they better? Are they worse? Did fewer people die? MRSA is a reason that um, hundreds of thousands of people in this country die. Basically, that comes from relatively unclean bathrooms in hospitals that don't pay attention to that. Uh, and accreditation folks don't pay enough attention to that either. That is, that is a disease which can be easily cured. One, by cleaning up bathrooms all the time, but secondly, um, it's, it's, it's just automatically a part of the expense part of health care, and it shouldn't be. Evidence-based outcomes. You prove to me that you're doing a better job this year than you were in the last two or three years, or whatever the, whatever the, the range might be. And so it's not fee for service. It's fee after the explanation of the efficacy and the life-saving quality of the service. That's the direction that a health care has to go. And that isn't discussed, but, but if this uh, whole bill is repealed, that is exactly uh, what will happen. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, everybody's held accountable. We're being held more accountable. Um, the big three automobile companies were held more accountable. And uh, they were embarrassed, and, but they've come back pretty nicely. I think the, the way we make our progress in America now is to make sure that people do what they're meant to be doing, and they do it well. And they can show it. That's actually some, some, of, some of the paperwork. Is you've got you to convince the folks from Medicaid or Medicare, whatever else it is, that you're doing a better job. I mean, if, if half of all Medicare is spent, as it is, in the last six months of life, that bears, I think that bears an analysis. Why is that so? What are we doing? What are we not doing? Don't just pay the bill because it's sent to you, but you look at it and you ask questions. That's, I think, the direction of the, of the uh, new health care, and I think it's a fair direction. It's one which I'm, I'm sure that the Mayo Clinic does uh, routinely. But uh, it's, it's, it's not a good idea. I will speak on this more later. But now I'm really waiting for Senator Baucus and Senator Hatch to get down here to really handle both matters since it's within their jurisdiction. I'm on the Finance Committee. I'm close to Senator Baucus, but I'm not Senator Baucus. So he needs to be down here to do that. And he's agreed to do that. So I hope he'll be done uh, shortly. Pending that situation, I note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
The U.S. Senate in a quorum call waiting for senators to return to the floor to speak today considering the uh, reauthorization of FAA, Federal Aviation Administration programs. The Republicans earlier today saying that they would look for the opportunity for a repeal amendment on health care. The uh, CQ writes today that one of those possible amendments is to repeal the 1099 reporting requirements in the health care law. It has, quote, broad support, according to uh, Democratic Senator Chuck Schumer of New York, the number three. Well, the House is not in at all this week. They will return a week from today. And, of course, our House coverage is on C-SPAN. On C-SPAN at this hour, we are airing comments from Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak speaking on Egyptian television. That is underway now, and you can follow that on C-SPAN. Also on the Senate side earlier today, news of uh, a budget cut legislation introduced by Senators Claire McCaskill and Bob Corker on the floor of the Senate. President, I want to... Just speak briefly on the amendment that's been introduced by uh, the Republican leader, Senator McConnell, that would in effect repeal the uh, health care bill that was passed on Christmas Eve uh, at 7 a.m. in the morning about a year ago, uh, a year ago this last uh, Christmas Eve. Since the time that the bill was passed, strictly along party lines, 60 votes, all of our colleagues on the Democratic side voted for it. All of the folks on our side voted against it. We predicted that this bill would lead to increase in premiums for those who have health insurance. It would, it would uh, raise taxes on everyone in order to fund this huge expansion of the federal government, some $2.7 trillion worth of extra spending. And it would also take a half a trillion dollars from Medicare which, as you know, Madam President, is a, one of our troubled entitlement programs that's sorely in need of reform, and uh, it takes a half a trillion dollars from Medicare to fund yet a new entitlement program, uh, this health care bill. We also know that uh, on at least two occasions now, a federal judge has uh, found that this bill violates the Constitution uh, of the United States because it says that Congress, that both of these judges have said that Congress has overreached its authority under that Constitution. Uh, the arguments were made that this was uh, within Congress's power, but actually I agree with uh, a law professor, uh, Jonathan Turley, whose comments I saw today, who said that if the Supreme Court of the United States upholds this health care bill as being within Congress's power, federalism is dead. There is no limit to the federal government's authority. If the federal government can compel you or me or anyone else to buy a government-approved product, there are no limitations. The Tenth Amendment of the United States Constitution that says all powers not delegated to the federal government are reserved to the states and to the people, it might as well be written out of the Constitution. So that's why I think these decisions are very important, uh, the one in Florida and the earlier one in Virginia, because they reveal, reveal, reveal a defect in this bill over and above the others that I've already mentioned. Raising taxes, taking from Medicare to create a new entitlement program, and, uh, and of course, uh, imposing this, this onerous uh, mandate. But the real problem with this bill, Madam President, is more nuanced and than, than, uh, than my remarks would suggest. What it does is by imposing a mandate on employers to provide government-approved health insurance or pay a penalty, what many employers are going to find out is that it will cost them less to pay the penalty than it will to provide health insurance for their employees. And thus, many Americans who have health coverage they like, which the President promised them time and time again they would be able to keep if they liked it, will find that that's not the case, because employers will, making a rational business decision where it costs less to pay the penalty than it does to provide the government mandated health care at the uh, 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 health insurance, uh, they will simply choose to drop their employees and thus they will have to go into the exchanges 
which are supposed to be created by 2014 under this bill. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, we know that the, uh, this bill was uh, gamed in all sorts of ways to try to provide a Congressional Budget Office score, which actually only reflects a fraction of its true cost implemented over 10 years. Uh, the most accurate estimate I've seen is that this bill actually will cost some $2.7 trillion over 10 years as opposed to the roughly $1 trillion price tag that the Congressional Budget Office was given, in part because it was over a ten, scored over a 10-year period of time, but only six years of implementation. And through various other ways, as I say, that score, the true cost of this bill, uh, was gained. But one of the things that the bill provides is that individuals who go to the state-based exchanges to buy their health insurance because they don't have it available from their employer will be subsidized by the federal taxpayers up to, I believe it's $88,000 for a family of four. What happens if a whole lot more people drop their coverage or their employers drop their coverage and they're forced to go to the state-based exchanges in order to buy their health care, which is subsidized uh, to this degree? Well, it's going to explode the costs of this health care bill in ways that the Congressional Budget Office score does not uh, adequately reflect. I'm not, uh, I'm not quibbling with the Congressional Budget Office. They take the assumptions that they are asked to take, um, and they do the best they can to try to predict what the cost will be. But again, it's possible, and indeed this is an example, to game the Congressional Budget Office scoring uh, process to make it look much cheaper than it will actually be once fully and finally implemented. And so at a time when uh, we're going to be asked to raise the, uh, the debt limit, uh, our credit card is maxed out, nearly maxed out, maxed out at $14 trillion plus at a time when our deficits are one and a half trillion dollars. That's just for this uh, current last fiscal year. Uh, we are left with the question of can we, all everything else aside about this health care bill, can we and can the American people afford it? And I would say the answer to that is absolutely not, because we can do so much better by making sure the government doesn't get between patients and their, and, and their doctor, and by leaving the flexibility and the choices in the hands of consumers to uh, make decisions that are in their best interest. I mean, we could, if we really tried, and I hope we will, uh, to, to come up with a better way of delivering health care, because unfortunately, we, this bill did not, well, really squandered an opportunity uh, to try to help bend that cost curve down. Indeed, all of the evidence is that it bends the cost cur curve up and makes it, more, um, makes it more expensive. Madam President, let me just conclude on this thought. At a time when the President's own fiscal commission says that our fiscal situation is dire and is unsustainable, at a time when the President, I had hoped during his State of the Union message, would say, this fiscal commission that I appointed has come up with a report. We need to take this seriously and need to work in a bipartisan basis to try to, uh, try to uh, fix what is broken about our uh, federal government's uh, finances. Uh, the President didn't do that. He talked about investment, which we all know when the federal government invests money, it's really code for more spending. And we've been on a spending binge, with binge the last two years with 42 cents on every dollar borrowed from the next generation and beyond. And we know we can't keep it up. So beyond the, the, the fundamental problems with this bill, number one, that it is unconstitutional, so held by two federal judges, that it will bend the, continues to make health care more expensive rather than more affordable and denies people the opportunity to keep what they have because of the incentives it puts on employers to dump their employees into the exchanges and that they will get the subsidies that Congress voted on, which will make this bill even more expensive than it um, was originally thought uh, to be. That this bill is one that should be repealed. We can, working together in a bipartisan basis, do better. This is what happens when one side or the other overreaches is uh, they think the victory is worth it when, in fact, what we find out, there's a tremendous backlash by the American people reflected in the November the 2nd election. The more they learn about this bill, 
They don't like it more. They like it less. And uh, now that the uh, federal, two federal judges have held that this bill is unconstitutional, it's time for us to take this matter up again once we repeal this bill and do a better job that we should have done in the first place. Madam President, I yield the floor. From Arizona. Thank you. Madam President, I want to commend my colleague from Texas, a former Supreme Court uh, Justice of uh, Texas, in analyzing the uh, legal issues as he has just done. Yet another uh, indication of why it is time for us to start over. And uh, I join him in urging repeal and replacement of this health care bill. I'd like to speak just briefly about yet another reason why this needs to be done. And it's a very uh, specific example. Uh, it, it concerns my home state of Arizona. And there are other states that are in the same position, but I can, I can speak to the uh, uh, specifics with respect to my own state. Uh, and it has to do with just one of the many burdensome new mandates. In this bill, as we know, there are mandates on individuals to purchase insurance, for example, as my colleague was just saying. There are mandates on families and companies and mandates on states as well. And I want to talk about the mandate on states, uh, which with respect to uh, the Medicaid provisions of the bill are called maintenance of effort mandates or MOE mandates. And let me describe what that is. The maintenance of effort requirement forces an unfunded Medicaid mandate on states by denying them the full ability to manage their Medicaid programs to fit their own budgets and their own unique Medicaid populations. Uh, this is a huge problem because Arizona, along with most other states, is experiencing a dire budget crisis. Our state has lost over 300,000 jobs in the last few years and revenue collections are down by 34% since the start of the recession. In the 2010 fiscal year, Arizona collected about $3 billion less in gross revenues than it did just three years prior in 2007. And during the same period, enrollment in Arizona's Medicaid program has increased by 44%. I mean, think of that. More than 1.3 million Arizonans are now covered by Medicaid. That's more than 20% of the entire population of our state. Ordinarily, the state would be able to dial back that coverage in order to fit within its budget. But believe it or not, the Obamacare law that was passed here prevents a state from managing its own Medicare, uh, or excuse me, Medicaid program by uh, determining who is going to be covered by that program. Right now, the Arizona program consumes almost 30% of the state's general fund spending, and that's an increase of 17% over four years ago. So Arizona could, as I said, dial this back except for one thing, and that is Obamacare. As our governor, Jan Brewer, noted in a recent letter to Speaker Boehner, and I'm quoting, the growth in Arizona Medicaid spending is a key cause of our state budget crisis and is unsustainable. We cannot afford this increase without gutting every other state priority, such as education and public safety, end of quote. So the Arizona legislature has uh, taken steps to address this. Uh, they have now cut $2.2 billion in spending from a $10 billion budget, but that doesn't go far enough to, to address the rest of their budget problems. Despite these cuts, the budget shortfall is, is projected to be $1.2 billion in the next fiscal year. And uh, so let me describe now how this maintenance of effort requirement or mandate uh, affects Arizona's budget. In 2009, the federal government imposed a mandate on states by which states could not change their Medicaid eligibility standards or methodologies and procedures in place on July 1, 2008. Uh, this sounds identical to the maintenance of effort requirement at Obamacare, but there's one crucial difference. The federal government's maintenance of effort stimulus requirement, the requirement I'm talking about was in the stimulus bill, was funded by the federal government. So the state was not adversely affected from a budget standpoint. Uh, under the stimulus, the states received an enhanced federal share of their Medicaid costs. But under Obamacare, the maintenance of effort requirement is still there, except that the states have to pick it up. They are stuck with an unfunded mandate. So even though states like Arizona can't afford their current Medicaid obligations, Obamacare has forced an extension of the maintenance effort requirement until 2014, but without providing any assistance to pay the exorbitant costs. 
In June of 2011, when stimulus funds expire, Arizona's share of its Medicaid program will increase by an astounding $700 million. The annual cost of the mandate is almost a billion dollars, which is simply unaffordable. And this problem is especially acute for Arizona and a handful of other states because we actually expanded Medicaid eligibility for childless adults beyond federal requirements. So Arizona, in an effort to cover more people, by law included additional people in the Medicaid coverage, adults without children. Rather than allow states like Arizona to cut back to the level of other states, for example, to forego that coverage, at least for now, the health care law, Obamacare, freezes in all of the existing disparities. So there are a big difference between or among the states depending upon how liberal, in effect, their coverage is. We have tried to do our best to find ways to ameliorate the problem. We've devoted more resource toward Medicaid fraud prevention. There have been some very difficult decisions made, as, for example, including uh, reimbursing uh, uh, health care providers uh, with less money. As you can imagine, that hasn't gone over well. Uh, even more controversial and very sad, Arizona has stopped Medicaid funding for several kinds of transplant surgeries on October 1st. This is actually a kind of rationing that's required by Obamacare. The state cannot afford to provide the most expensive procedures and therefore it has to cut them back, all because they are prevented by law from dialing back the coverage of these adults without children. So the one place that they can cut is on transplants. A very sad day, as I said. There's nothing good to say about it. Nobody's pleased with the outcome, but there's no other option. But even that option obviously doesn't save enough money to forestall this budget crisis. Many of those who have been critics of the decision with respect to transplants have failed to tell the whole story, which is that the governor had to make that difficult decision um, because the health care reform bill uh, eliminated a key option that she otherwise would have had to dial back the coverage to the level of other states. Before enactment of the president's health care bill, the federal government and states were partners in health care delivery. Now states are merely a financing mechanism for the federal government's demands. What states need is permanent, reduced Medicaid demand by way of authority to reduce eligibility standards for their Medicaid programs. As I'm suggesting, all Arizona wants the authority to do is dial it back to where other states are. Governor Brewer recently made a formal request from HHS Secretary Sebelius for a waiver from the maintenance of effort provision. Since the administration has granted over 700 waivers to companies and labor unions, one can only hope that the same fairness will be provided to states who are much more crucial partners to the federal government in the delivery of health care. Under the terms of the waiver request, Arizona would preserve Medicaid coverage for one million Arizonans who represent the core of Medicaid's mission, the aged, disabled, blind, pregnant women and children. I support the governor's request, and I urge the administration to grant the waiver. But ultimately, Madam President, only repeal of this law will provide permanent relief to all of the states, uh, like Arizona and all of the other states similarly situated. So I am strongly in support of the amendment that provides for repeal and replacement uh, with something that will work and will not punish our families, our residents, and our states. Senator from New York. Thank you, Madam President. And I've just come to address the two bills that are, the two amendments that are before us. First, I want to salute my colleague, Senator Rockefeller, and all of those, Senator Hutchinson, and on all of those on both sides of the aisle who have brought this FAA bill before us. It's something that's needed. It's something that's long overdue. It's sad that America, in America, we don't have a GPS system where just about every Western country does. Uh, even Mongolia does. Tibet does not. Um, and um, to move forward and modernize our airports, it's important for jobs. It's important for travelers' convenience. But I would say most of all, it's important for America's productivity. Uh, when people sit and wait on a runway, where planes are delayed or flights canceled, 
the amount of output that our country loses is enormous and we're losing much more than a France or an England or a Germany because they have these modern systems and it's about time we put them in and I just make one other point about it there are some who say let's go back to the 2006 level of spending in 2006 the budget did not have a GPS system well certainly we have to cut where there's waste to so just across the board roll the clock back doesn't make much sense Technology advances, the world advances, and we cannot just march backwards. There are certain things that we need to keep this country strong, and the President talked about some of those in his address. Uh, investments, and transportation's always been one since the days of the Erie Canal caused my city, New York City, to become the largest city in the country, and still is, praise God. Um, but I came here to talk about um, the two amendments that are before us, and it's sort of a do and don't, in my opinion. The health care bill, we had a long debate. We all know how long it was. The American people decided. The majority do not want to repeal the bill. In fact, 80% don't. Even those who want to change it, the majority say, don't repeal it, just change it. And that's the point here. Senator Stabenow is offering an amendment to change something in the bill that very much needs change. The change in the reporting requirements to 1099 put an onerous obligation on small business people. My dad was a small business man, and I know how small business people struggle. And to ask them to file paperwork every time they bought something new, even of low cost, it's a bit over the top. So I'm glad we're repealing that. No one's claiming ownership that's going to pass in a bipartisan way. None of us on this side of the aisle are saying that the health care bill can't be improved. But to just repeal it without putting anything in place, there are a number of problems. One problem, which we'll see tomorrow when the actual vote is called, it would increase the deficit by $260 billion in the first decade and a trillion dollars in the second. Because the health care bill actually does cut some costs. And we know there is a tremendous amount of duplication, inefficiency, waste in our health care system. It's the best in the world. It's probably the least efficient in the world. And our goal and our job is to keep that quality care for people, but at the same time reduce the inefficiencies that cost the government and cost businesses. So <clears throat> it does reduce the deficit. When our colleagues are off for repealing, when Senator McConnell, our leader, Republican leader, offers to repeal it, he's going to increase the deficit. So we have all this talk, we have to reduce the deficit, and then the first move that the other side makes, whether you like the health care bill or not, is increase the deficit. Why wouldn't they propose $260 billion in other cuts to at least keep the bill deficit neutral? But the second point I'd make is this. Repeal says get rid of everything. It's simple, it's easy, it's quick. It's wrong. And there are many good things in this bill supported not only by the majority of Americans, the vast majority, many of which are supported by the majority of Republican voters who were polled, but even supported by many members on the other side of the aisle. I've heard them speak. Even the new freshman class that is coming in to the House, very militant, but they say, but I'm not for repealing this or I'm not for repealing that. And so why can't our colleagues on the other side of the aisle at least acknowledge that there are very good things that people like? When they say repeal, do they want to repeal the provision that makes it easier for senior citizens to pay for prescription drugs? The so-called donut hole, which says after you, and this comes from the Medicare bill that George Bush put forth, not from this health care bill, but they didn't have enough money to pay for it. And so they said that after $2,500, seniors would have to pay prescription drug costs on their own. Well, any of us who bought, buy prescription drugs, I do, just taking one for my back, my back went out yesterday, knows how expensive they are. And you get up to $2,500 when you're a senior citizen and need eight medications, two for your blood pressure, one for diabetes, one for cholesterol, you name it. You get up to that in no time. And our seniors in my state, and I'm sure in yours, Madam President, and any, every one of the other 48 states, are having real trouble paying for prescription drugs once they reach that donut hole. 
once they reach the level af after which Medicare no longer pays. Well, in the health care bill, we deal with that. We reduce their costs 50% in the first year. That saves the average senior citizen, and this is not chicken feed, $550. And by the time it's fully implemented, we save them $2,400 a year. You want to repeal that? Well, when you vote for repeal, you're voting to repeal it. How about this one? There are countless American families who have kids in their early 20s. They get out of college, they get a job. Let's hope it's hard to get a job these days. And by the way, we should be focusing on job creation, not on repealing this bill. The FAA bill does that, as I mentioned. And they have a dilemma. These new jobs, they're new, they're not paying the top dollar, most of them, and they don't come with health care. What do these young people do? They can't afford the health care themselves, $800, $900, $1,000 a month. They're not making that much money, but they know, God forbid, they get into a car accident or get a serious disease. How can they be without health care? It's been a dilemma that has plagued American families from coast to coast, from north to south and east to west. The health care bill corrects it. Here's what it says, very simply, that any young person, 21 to 26, can stay on their family's health care plan. It's a great idea. It's very popular. I want to ask my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who are going to vote for repeal. Are you for taking away the benefit of young people, 21 to 26, to stay on their family's health care plan if they wish? I doubt it. How about this one? We all know that preventative medicine saves billions. And so in the health care bill, every senior citizen on Medicare gets a wellness checkup free once a year to encourage them to go in. Why? Not because we want some giveaway, but the statistics show overwhelmingly and without doubt conclusively that when senior citizens get a preventative care checkup, not only are they healthier, but it saves the Medicare system billions and billions of dollars. You catch, God forbid someone has one, that melanoma before the melanoma gets into the lymph nodes. It's a simple operation rather than thousands and thousands of dollars and months and months of agony and illness. Want to stop those checkups? You give people a colonoscopy or any of these other preventative exams, mammography, saves the taxpayers much money. The recipient is healthier. That's why we put it in the bill. You want to repeal those? You want to tell every senior citizen you don't get that free wellness checkup, which will save billions? I can't believe you would want to do that to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. How about this one? Small businesses. Small businesses are not required to have health care now, and under our bill, if they're under 50 employees, they won't be required to. But some of them provide health care for their employees. Some do it because it's a good way to retain a good young employee or a good middle-aged or a good older employee. Some do it because the employer is just a good guy or gal. Well, what we tell them is if you have a business that makes less than $1.2 million and has fewer than 25 workers, we will give you a 35% tax credit for that health care. It's a great thing. Hundreds of thousands of businesses in my state of New York will benefit. It started January 1st. And what does it mean? It means A, more people get health care. B, it means businesses have more money to spend on job creation, small businesses, because some of their health care costs are being defrayed. And C, it may mean that a small business that wasn't going to provide health care for its workers can now. Want to get rid of that? Tax credit for small businesses, the mainstay of America? I don't think you do. How about this one? We all have heard of insurance companies. You call up your insurance company and you say, my wife, my husband, my daughter, my son has gotten this terrible illness and it requires an operation that costs a whole lot of money. And then you get a call back from the insurance company and they say, you know what? your policy doesn't quite cover this. Or when you signed it, you were supposed to check this little box and you didn't, you're out. If you don't dot every I and cross every T, they usually let you get away with it, they're collecting your money. 
but not when somebody has a serious illness that might cost them thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Now the insurance company calls you up and it's basically tough rocks, Jack. Under our bill, that can't happen anymore. And when the insurance companies decide to raise their rates dramatically, there's an insurance commissioner in the state and federal authorities who can say, you've got to show us that you needed to raise the rates as much as you did. Want to get rid of that? Let insurance companies just rule the roost? I don't think so. So there is so much in this bill that is good, that is supported by the overwhelming majority of Democrats, Independents, and Republicans. There is so much in this bill that moves us forward. If you think there are things that shouldn't be in the bill, come talk to us. 1099 is a bipartisan effort. Senator Stabenow has been out front. I know last week Senators Klobuchar, Cantwell, and Nelson sent a letter to uh, Congress uh, Speaker Boehner saying, please get us a 1099 bill. Senator Johans has done a good job. It's bipartisan. And we're not saying everything is perfect in this bill. We're not saying it can't be improved. We're saying let's work together in a bipartisan manner to make it better. What the other side is saying is just repeal. Repeal the good things, repeal the things they don't like, create a huge hole in our deficit, and leave us with nothing. The slogan was going to be, repeal and replace. Well, we've only heard the first part of that slogan. Where's the replace? I'll tell you why there's no replace. It's hard. It's hard to take this huge, unwieldy, inefficient health care system and shape it up. That's why it took us so long, and that's why it created a great deal of controversy. I'll be the first to admit it. But I don't see a substitute. If you wanted to be fair, and you were being straight with the American people about actually improving people's health care, you'd have a replacement on the floor, and then we could compare the repeal of what you want to what you propose. We'll wait. Maybe we should have a clock. First day without repeat, replace. Second day without replace. Third day. I have a feeling that we're not going to see a replacement. And you know what that would say? hate to say it. It would say this is just a political. Throw some red meat to some on the hard right who want it repealed, but don't dare show a replacement. Because guess what? To replace is hard, and you really don't have a solution for replacement. So I would urge we vote strongly against the McConnell resolution. I would urge my colleagues on the other side to rethink it. And I look forward to hearing the remarks of not only the chairman of the Commerce Committee, who is head of this FAA bill, but also the number two person, the ranking Democrat on the Finance Committee on which I serve, who has made so many invaluable contributions to the bill, both on the cost-cutting side, in terms of uh, the 80 and 85 percent rule, and all the other things that we have done. So with that, I would be happy uh, to yield the floor so I might hear my distinguished colleague, the senior senator from West Virginia, uh, speak for a few minutes.